But I think uh, basically what we have here is a war between the United States and Russia. Uh, and uh, there's no end in sight. Uh, I cannot think of how this can end uh, in the near future. Uh, and I think there's a very dangerous uh, chance of escalation. Uh, first of all, escalation to where the United States is actually doing the fighting uh, against Russia. The two sides are clashing militarily, which hasn't happened so far. And I think there's a serious danger of nuclear escalation here. I'm not saying that it's likely, but uh, I can tell stories on how it actually happens. So the question is, how did we get into this mess? You know, so what caused it? And the reason it's very important to deal with that issue is it has all sorts of implications for understanding Russian thinking. Uh, if you want to understand how the Russians think about this crisis, you have to understand the causes. Uh, now, the mainstream view, which I, of course, reject, is that Vladimir Putin is either a congenital aggressor or uh, he is just determined to recreate the Soviet Union or some version of, of the Soviet Union. He's an expansionist. He's an imperialist. Uh, I think that argument is wrong, and my view is that this is really all about the West's efforts to turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's borders. Uh, and the key element in that strategy, of course, is NATO expansion. And in my story, it all goes back to the April 2008 decision at the NATO summit in Bucharest uh, where it was said that both Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. The Russians made it manifestly clear at the time that this was unacceptable, that neither Georgia nor Ukraine were going to become part of NATO. And in fact, the Russians made it clear that they viewed this as an existential threat. Uh, very important to understand those words. From the Russian point of view, from the get-go, this was perceived as an existential threat. Lots of people in the West do not believe uh, it is an existential threat to the Russians, but what they believe is irrelevant because the only thing that matters is what Putin and his fellow Russians think, and they think it is an existential threat. Uh, now, I think to be honest, that the evidence is overwhelming, that this is not a case of Putin acting as an imperialist, uh, and it is a case of NATO expansion. Uh, if you look at his February 24th speech justifying why uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, it is all about uh, NATO expansion, uh, and the fact that that is perceived to be, by him, uh, an existential threat to Russia. If you look at the deployment of forces in Ukraine, it's hard to make the argument that the Russians are bent on conquering and occupying and integrating Ukraine into a greater Russia. Uh, if you listen to Zelensky talk about a possible solution, the first thing he goes to is talking about creating a neutral Ukraine. That tells you that this is really all about NATO expansion and Ukrainian neutrality. Furthermore, there is no evidence of uh, Putin saying that what he wants to do uh, is actually make Ukraine part of Russia. Uh, there's no evidence of him saying that this is feasible uh, and that he intends to do it. Uh, there's no question that in his heart, he would like to see uh, Ukraine be part of Russia. Uh, in his heart, he would probably like to see the Soviet Union come back. But as he has made manifestly clear, that is not possible. And anybody who thinks that way is not thinking straight. He has, in effect, said that. Uh, so I would like someone to point out to me the evidence where he makes it clear that what he is actually doing in terms of formulating policy is trying to create a greater Russia or reconstitute the Soviet Union. Uh, 
All of this is to say, if you believe like I do, that he is facing an existential threat, you're in effect saying he views this as a threat to Russia's survival. And if he's in a situation like that, he cannot lose. When you face an existential threat, you don't lose. You have no choice. You have to win. Now, this brings us to the American side. What are the Americans doing? What we're doing, which is what we did uh, after the crisis broke out on February 22nd, 2014, is we're doubling down. Uh, we have decided that what we're going to do is we are going to defeat Russia inside of Ukraine. We're going to deliver a decisive defeat against the Russians inside of Ukraine. And at the same time, we're going to strangle their economy. We're going to put wicked sanctions on them, and we're going to bring them to their knees. We, in other words, are going to win, and they're going to lose. Furthermore, the Biden administration and the president himself has gone to enormous lengths to ramp up the rhetoric and portray the Russians as the font of all evil, and to portray us as the good guys, and to create the impression in people's minds that this is a situation that doesn't lend itself to compromise because you can't compromise with the devil. In fact, what has to be done here is we have to win. Now, you know that it would be a devastating defeat for Joe Biden if the Russians were to win this war. And of course, as I just said to you, from the Russian point of view, they have to win this war because this is an existential threat that they are facing. So the question you then want to ask yourself is, where does that leave us? Both sides have to win. It's impossible for both sides to win. Not when you think about the situation that we're facing here. So how do we get a negotiated settlement? I, I just don't see it happening. I don't see the Russians giving any meaningful ground, and I certainly don't see the Americans giving any meaningful ground. So what is likely to happen? There's now talk on our side, and even on the Russian side, that this war is gonna go on for years. In other words, we're gonna have a war between the United States and Russia that goes on for years. Now, I understand that we are not involved in the fighting at this point, but we are about as close as you can get to being involved. And then you start saying to yourself, is it not possible that we will get dragged into this one? Uh, there's a huge amount of political pressure on the Biden administration for us, you know, to implement the no-fly zone, to actually go in for humanitarian purposes to Ukraine, and so forth and so on. So far, Bi so far Biden has been able to resist that pressure, but will he be able to resist it forever? And what if we have a military incident that drags us into the fighting? So we could very well end up in a situation where the United States and Russia are fighting against each other in Ukraine. Then we come to the issue of nuclear escalation. Uh, I think, first of all, if the United States gets dragged into a fight against Russia, uh, and it's a conventional war in Ukraine or over Ukraine in the air, uh, the United States will clobber the Russians. Uh, if the Ukrainians are doing so well against the Russians militarily, you can imagine how much better the Americans will do in air-to-air -air engagements and even on the ground, right? In that situation, don't you think it's possible that Ukraine, I mean, excuse me, that Russia would turn to nuclear weapons? I think it's possible. Uh, I've studied a lot of military history. I've studied the Japanese decision to attack the United States at Pearl Harbor in 1941. I've studied the German decision um, 
to launch World War I during the July crisis in 1914. Uh, I've looked at the Egyptian decision to attack Israel in 1973. These are all cases where decision makers felt they were in a desperate situation, and they all understood that in a very important way, they were rolling the dice. They were pursuing an incredibly risky strategy, but they just felt they had no choice. They felt that their survival was at stake. Uh, so what we're talking about here is taking a country like Russia, right, that thinks it's facing an existential threat, that thinks its survival is at stake, and we're pushing it to the limit. We're talking about breaking it. We're talking about not only defeating it in Ukraine, but breaking it economically. I think this is a remarkably dangerous situation, and I find it quite remarkable that we're approaching this whole issue in such a cavalier way. And by the way, I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that so many people who were involved in thinking about this problem today were raised during the unipolar moment and not during the Cold War. During the Cold War, as someone like Jack can tell you even better than me, we thought long and hard about nuclear war. We thought long and hard about US-Soviet relations and how that might lead to a nuclear war. People who grew up in the unipolar moment are much more cavalier about these issues. And I think this presents a very dangerous situation. Now, I would note that even if the Russians and the Americans don't end up fighting each other, but the Ukrainians are able to stagger the Russians in Ukraine and deliver significant defeats on them, the Russians may still turn to nuclear weapons. It's possible. Is it likely? No, but it's possible. And that scares me greatly. And it should scare most Americans and certainly most Europeans. So all of this is to say, when I look at the US-Russia relationship today, I think we're effectively at war with each other. Although again, the Americans are not fighting against the Russians on the battlefield. But this is a very dangerous situation. Now, what about Ukraine? Don't the Ukrainians have any agency? I mean, after all, it's their country that's being destroyed. One could make the argument that the West, especially the United States, is willing to fight this war to the last Ukrainian. Uh, and the end result is Ukraine is, in effect, being wrecked as a country. Given that they have agency, is it not possible that the Ukrainians themselves will say enough is enough and put an end to this? Uh, sadly, I don't think that's the case. And I think the fact is that the United States will not allow the Ukrainians to cut a deal that the United States finds unacceptable. The Washington Post had a piece on Monday that made it very clear that the administration and our NATO allies are very worried that the Ukrainians are going to cut a deal with the Russians that makes it look like the Russians won war that in fact concedes that the Russians have won, at least to some extent. We do not want that to happen. As I said before, the Biden administration is out to inflict a decisive defeat on Russia. If the Ukrainians decide to cut a deal and allow Russia to win in some meaningful sense, the Americans are going to say that's unacceptable. And the Americans will work with the right-wing nationalists in Ukraine to undermine Zelensky or his successor. So I see no way Ukraine can stop, step in and put a stop uh, to this crisis. I just see it going on and on. Um, let me conclude by saying that George Kennan said uh, in the late 1990s uh, that NATO expansion was a tragic mistake. Uh, and that it would lead to the beginning of a new Cold War. Uh, at first, it looked like he was wrong. We had the first tranche of expansion in 1999, uh, and we got away with it. We had the second tranche of expansion in 2004, and we got away with that. But then when the decision was made in April 2008 for a third tranche, which would include Georgia and Ukraine, it's quite clear that we had moved a bridge too far. And the end result, I'm sad to say, is that I think that Kennan's uh, prediction has proved true. Thank you.
Okay, well, um, thank you, Professor Mearsheimer, for that um, rather alarming uh, wake-up call. Um, I hope some people in, uh, in positions of power here in Washington uh, are listening. Um, uh, Marlene, you're up. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, several points I wanted to make. The first one is that I agree about the shared responsibility of the West in the kind of strategy deadlock and the fact that Russia is seeing NATO expansion as an existential threat. But I would still dissociate the strategic de deadlock, <clears throat> which is a shared responsibility from the decision to do war and to do that kind of war, a full-scale invasion targeting civilian. And for me, <clears throat> sorry, this is Russia's alone decision. In fact, it's Putin's alone decision taken against, <clears throat> sorry, the will of the majority of the Russian political establishment. So I think there was other ways for Russia to react than the war and the war is weakening, <clears throat> sorry, Russia's legitimacy on, on the long run. <clears throat> I have three key points I just wanted to make. The first one is the question of avoidability. The war was avoidable. It was not written in the Putin's regime DNA that they would invade. There was many other way they wanted to be influential and to keep spheres of influence. And of course, Russia is a former colonial imperial center. It has disdain toward the new uh, post-Soviet societies, but that could have stayed only at the kind of cultural, societal aspect, and that should may not have been transformed into, into a war. And when I say that there are, there are many ways of being a great power, and I think Russia has genuinely tested several uh, uh, of them, and really in the 2000s thought that integrating into the world community, into the world economy would make its voice heard and its claims kind of partly uh, recognized. And it's only when they realize that this integration strategy was not working, that the kind of classic old fashioned sphere of influence mechanism was not working, that they begin looking to other strategies that were more related to kind of maintaining, keeping or provoking territory, territorial instability in the, 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 the countries around. So what I'm trying to say that there have been for me a shift from Russia thinking it can keep Ukraine in a sphere of influence away from NATO to moving to a, a, a strategy that is now about territorial conquest or at least grab of land. And I agree, Russia and Putin doesn't want to recreate the Soviet Union or the Russian empire. It's not about that. It's using now grab of lands as a kind of solution to the failure of being respected as a great power. And I think that's a, that's a, 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 a very concerning a, a trend. My second point is that uh, Professor Scheimer, you were saying about it's all about NATO expansion for Russia. And I think it was the case until now. Sure, it is now anymore. I think now, unfortunately, it has become much more complex on the Russian side. And I think we have to recognize there have been a kind of crescendo, a gradual move in the way Russia is framing the conflict that is of concern. What we have now, it's narrative that are ambiguously either about the strategic concern of uh, a Ukraine joining NATO, or that is about purely denying Ukraine's legitimacy as a state and as a nation. There have been really ambiguous comments in uh, uh, Putin uh, uh, speeches and of uh, uh, several of other official governments. I mean, there are real strategies of destatization of Ukraine that I found problematic. I found there are Russian kind of schizophrenic narrative about Ukrainians need to be told by force that they are a brotherly nation with Russia and all the narrative about denazification. I mean, Ukraine has a far right culture. Russia has one, the US has one. You have transnational far right groups. I don't think the way it has been framed by Russia is legitimate. It's really, and you may have seen the RIA Novosti articles a few days ago. It's really calling for mass killing. And of course, it's really a novelty. It's not an official statement by Putin or Lavrov, but it has been authorized. So my, what I'm trying to say now is that it has become more complex on the Russian side. I think because of the failure of getting their great power claim respected, now they have moved to something that is much more complex and much more dangerous. And my third point is that the Russian's vision is not static. And I think we have, it's not written in stone as we have seen it's evolving. And I think we have to realize now that things are still evolving on the Russian side because war is a kind of revolutionary open-ended moment. And so Russia is still adjusting its own vision 
its own narrative and its own capacities on the ground and all that is in flux. And I think it's important for us to realize that you have all these contradictory narratives arriving from the Russian side. Sometimes Russia seems to say it's just about getting a friendly regime in Kyiv and being sure that Ukraine is neutral. Sometimes it seems to be saying like Ukraine should be partitioned and Eastern territories should join Russia or be a kind of buffer zone. And sometimes it's about Ukraine is not legitimate to exist at all. And I think we should realize this complexity because what is telling us, it's telling us that there are tensions at the Kremlin. The Kremlin is not a unified uh, uh, system. You have, it's an ad, ad, ad hoc construction and there is a party of war in Russia that is pushing for the radicalization of narrative. That is very unhappy with the diplomatic talks going on now. And I think it's really important for us to realize at least this three language of Russia on the war and the NATO one is unfortunately not the only one now. And we have to be sure we try to invite Russia to going back to discussing the neutrality issues, which is the, the easiest one, in fact, and avoiding the Russian uh, uh, policy moving toward really accusation of Ukraine not being a legitimate state, because that would make the discussion relatively impossible to to. Uh, 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 um, to finalize. And I agree with you about the fact that, I mean, we need to fast to find face saving solution for Russia. And we need to be sure that if Ukraine is able to cut a deal with Russia, there is no US kind of regime and strategies or maintaining of sanctions that would of course make things impossible uh, on the Russian side to be, to be accepted. So I'm just, I will stop here, but just to say that I think things are still very much in flux that it's mostly a shared responsibilities, but the war is Putin's responsibility largely against the will of his own governments. And that we have now worrisome narratives coming from the Russian side about Ukraine legitimacy to exist that we should take into consideration and do our best to try to push Russia to go back about just discussing the, the strategic aspect and, and, and stopping NATO expansion and not moving to really narrative that are, that are uh, uh, disempowering the pure existence of, of Ukraine. I will stop here, thank you. Any question, John, you may wish to reply uh, or there may be questions from the panelists or additional comments in light of your other panelists' comments. Well, I'd love to reply, but I think it's better if we go to Q&A uh, rather than have me talk again. Okay, we are gonna do that. Um, and there are many, so to what extent, Professor Mearsheimer, uh, do you believe the Ukrainian far right stops the government in Kiev from cutting a deal with the Russians? I think that when Zelensky ran for president, he made it very clear that he wanted to work out an arrangement with Russia that ended the crisis in Ukraine. And he won. And what he then tried to do was move toward implementing the Minsk II agreement. If you were going to shut down the conflict in Ukraine, you had to implement Minsk II. And Minsk II meant giving the Russian speaking and the ethnic Russian population in the easternmost part of Ukraine, the Donbass region, a significant amount of autonomy. And you had to make you, uh, the Russian language an official language of Ukraine once again. That had to be done. I think Zelensky found out very quickly that because of the Ukrainian right, it was impossible to implement Minsk II. Therefore, even though the French and the Germans, and of course the Russians were very interested in making Minsk II work because they wanted to shut down the crisis, they couldn't do it. In other words, the Ukrainian right was able to stymie Zelensky on that front. Now, Zelensky understands that if he cuts a deal with Russia today, he has to face the Ukrainian right. That's why Zelensky has said that any peace agreement has to be approved by the Ukrainian public. He's going to ask for a referendum. 
because Zelensky understands that he cannot take the Ukrainian right on by himself. So basically, we have a situation where Zelensky is stymied. Now, very importantly, the Americans will side with the Ukrainian right because the Americans and the Ukrainian right both do not want Zelensky cutting a deal with the Russians that makes it look like the Russians won. So this is the principal reason uh, I'm very uh, pessimistic about Ukraine's ability to help shut this one down. I wanted to go back to Professor Mearsheimer to comment or to just speak in closing about um, the moment and what lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I mainly wanted to respond to three sets of points that Marletta sure. made. Uh, first of all, you talked about Putin targeting civilians or the Russians targeting civilians. Uh, it's obviously very hard to tell exactly what's happened here, but with that caveat in mind, you want to remember that the Americans have been pushing to arm civilians in Ukraine and to tell those civilians to fight against the Russians. So by definition, in lots of the firefights that are, have taken place and will take place, Russians are going to be fighting against civilians because those civilians are fighting against the Russians. So just remember, this is a very complicated business. Second point has to do with Putin's thinking and also your comments about the narratives that are taking place inside Russia. The fact is, we have no idea who Putin is talking to. Uh, and we really have no idea exactly what he's thinking these days. There's just no way we could know that. And uh, it is, you use the term black box. It's kind of a black box. We can look at what he said on February 24th or February 21st and so forth and so on. But who knows for sure what he's thinking. Uh, when it comes to narratives, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how public discourse matches up with decision making in a crisis. If you go to a decision like the Cuban Missile Crisis or the German decision to invade France in 1940, basically you have a handful of policymakers in the room who are making the decision to do something. And what they think is what matters. And the narratives that are swirling around in the broader public really don't matter. Uh, so I understand that if you look at the narratives in Russia today, you can find all sorts of evidence of people talking about doing X or doing Y or doing Z in Ukraine. But in the end, what really matters is what Putin and his close advisors are thinking and why exactly they decided on February 24th to invade Ukraine. And we really don't have good information to analyze that situation at this point in time. My final set of comments, <coughs> excuse me, have to do with your point about Russian interest in grabbing territory in Ukraine. I actually think the Russians had zero interest in grabbing territory in Ukraine, and that includes eastern Ukraine. The main reason that the Russians wanted to implement the Minsk II Accords and wanted to work with Zelensky to do that is they wanted to shut down the problem in eastern Ukraine. They did not want to conquer the Donbass. Furthermore, when things really began to get bad in mid-February, they recognized those territories in the Donbass as independent states. They didn't move to make them part of Russia as they had done with Ukraine. And with regard to the future, it's not at all clear that Russia will move to take those parts of Eastern Ukraine that it's conquered and integrate them into a greater Russia.
I wouldn't be surprised if they created an independent state, simply because it's probably more trouble than it's worth to conquer that territory. So I don't think the Russians, contrary to the conventional wisdom in the United States, have really had any interest in conquering Ukraine. Because as I said many years ago in the 2014 essay in Foreign Affairs that Katrina um, referenced in her introduction, for Russia, conquering Ukraine would be like swallowing a porcupine. Thank you. <laughs>